David Wood was there. Tutash was there. Anthony Rogers was there. Edward Dalcourt. Vocabulon was there. All right, yeah, so what, what is Dawah? So Dawah is to invite, right? It means to invite. And it's the concept of uh, Muslims going out and inviting people to Islam, right? The Quran talks about this. It, it tells Muslims to do this, right? Or, you know, it doesn't have to be all Muslims, but it, it definitely makes it says that, you know, even if it's a small group of Muslims, some Muslims have to be involved in the work of Dawah, inviting people to Islam. The Quran speaks about, um, you know, inviting people to Islam with wisdom and good preaching. And it says to, you know, to, to have discourses and dialogues or debates with these with, with the people, of course, in a good manner. So that's that's what uh, Dawah is. It is it is the inviting of people to Islam using wisdom, using good preaching, using dialogues, discourse, debate, etc. But again, to be done in you know, a, a, a good manner. Okay, so okay, please so raise your hand if you've seen an actual Dawah table in person before. Oh, about half of you. Okay, great. And we want to have our discussers talk about Dawah and what that looks like in their part of the world and what they usually experience when Muslims are doing Dawah. So who would like to go first? Ladies first. Ladies first. Right next to me here, Hatun Tosh. Ladies first, because I've got short memory and I'll just tell you what happened today. Um, we were in mosque to do outreach, help Muslims to do da'wah, help Muslims to invite us to Islam. So we went to mosque and after the prayer finished, Imam took the mic and then said, there are a group of Christians outside, don't engage with them, ignore them. So that's the da'wah. You, the way you invite people into Islam, you just don't talk to them, ignore them. <laughs> you ask your Muslim friend, give me da'wah, what is the good news of Islam? I am afraid to tell you, you won't even hear for wife offer, because they have no good news in Islam. They are out there to simply attack what you believe, they are trained to attack what you believe without not even knowing what Islam is. I am surprised the gentleman on the video, which we will see him, I think, tomorrow, uh, is talking about wisdom and good manner. I haven't come across Muslims who are like nicely inviting me to Islam. And I don't know, Anthony? My memory is worse than Hatoon's, so I'm just going to talk and hope it addresses the question. No. Uh, yeah, so Hatoon mentioned today we went to the mosque. To me, it's an odd thing because my experience of Muslims has been at least this, that they like to talk. Typically, they, they seem part of it is that the Quran talks about Christianity. This gives Muslims a overweening confidence when they talk to Christians. They think they already have the goods on us. They know all about what we believe even though the Quran is terribly wrong on our beliefs. So they often have this confidence in talking to Christians that sometimes Christians don't have because they don't realize that while the Bible doesn't talk about Islam because there was no such thing, in spite of Muslims claiming it's the religion of Adam and so forth, the Bible doesn't directly speak about Islam. So a lot of Christians think, I, I don't know what to do here. But the Bible, of course, does indirectly talk about Islam. Every time it's talking about pagan gods, uh, false prophets and so forth. It, Islam is just another instantiation of that. Uh, in fact, uh, as an, a little aside here, in the Old Testament, uh, the you have the incident of Elijah versus the Baal worshippers. And the Baal worshippers are crying out, he is Baal, he is Baal, right? They're trying to get their God to respond. The name of the idol in Mecca that represented the chief deity that Muhammad called the God, right, Allah, that its name, that idol's name was Hubal. In Hebrew, when you say he is Baal, the word for he is who, right? He is who, uh, uh, wait, who is he, he is she, she is who. It, it's an interesting little phrase that in re remembering Hebrew, 
certain words that sound like one thing in English actually mean something else in Hebrew. But you say he is Baal by saying who Baal, right? So in a sense, the Bible is already talking about this deity. You should have more confidence when you talk with Muslims. And uh, but so Muslims, uh, usually my experience is they think they've got what they need to deal with you as a Christian and to prove Islam. But you go to the mosque and these guys suddenly become sheeps. I mean, sheepish, right? They're, you know, every single time I've been to the mosque. And so my usually I'm trying to rope them into a conversation. So I'll usually say I usually do what I call dry witnessing. Now, for those of you that don't know, I, uh, I was converted in prison when I was 18 years old back in 1993. And there was something they called dry snitching. That's where when you had two people in a cell and one person does something wrong and the guards come and then the one guy says, I don't know who did it, but it wasn't me. Right. <laughs> in other words, <laughs> it's got to be the other guys. They call that dry snitching. So I do what I call dry witnessing, where I talk to another Christian in their hearing and I'm intending for them to hear what I'm saying because they're not they're not going to talk to me. Right. So I'll say something. And so I what I kept doing was I just kept saying, I wonder why Muslims are always afraid to talk about the truth. I wonder why Muslims hate people so much that they won't tell them what they think is the only hope. You know, I wonder why Christians go to mosques to talk to Muslims to try and tell, you know, why is it the Christians love Muslims and Muslims don't seem to love Christians? It's you know, just stuff like that. That's that was my attempt out there to try and rope them into some conversations. But. It's, a, it's an interesting thing. Dawa, uh, uh, they're only out there, it seems, when they're when they're trying to earn brownie points. In their minds, they're, they're doing certain things to earn Allah's favor. And apart from that, they don't seem to really have an interest. You know, when I go out there, and I said it to people earlier, my interest is not, I don't have any special interest in refuting Islam as such. If, if there was no such thing as the cross of Christ, Christ died for me, rose again, and so forth. I would just let Muslims go on their merry way. It wouldn't matter to me. The reason I'm out there opposing Islam is because Islam stands in the way of their believing in Christ. But I don't get the impression that their dawah efforts have any more, have any other reason behind it than an attempt to curry their God's favor. It's not out of a genuine love. So I mean, those are just some of my initial thoughts on some of this. Uh, uh, I'll leave it to these guys to fill in more details. Sure. I'll tell you about my first experience of Dawa, and I was working uh, as an engineer and there was an active Muslim in the factory where I was working and uh, some of the other employees said, we have to get these two people together. We need to get the Christian and the Muslim together. And so I met with the Muslim and his first sentence to me was, Muhammad is foretold, sorry, Jesus... Jesus foretold the coming of Muhammad in the Gospel of Barnabas, but the church has suppressed this. Now, th th this is 1993, 92, something like that. I had never heard of the Gospel of Barnabas. And so, in all conscience, I couldn't say you're wrong. I couldn't say you're right because I, I'd never heard of it. It'd be ignorant of me to make a statement, so I had to go away and find out. But I think that that's a typical experience for, for many Christians when they meet with Muslims because they have 1,400 years of historical theology on how to question Christians. And it can be quite disconcerting for a Christian who's not encountered this before to, to get these questions. Now, we can go away and we, we can look it up. And with the internet now, you can look it up quite quickly. But for many Christians, it, it can be quite a shock. And that was my first uh, encounter and I, I moved on from there to make sure I got answers and, uh, and my Muslim friend there uh, rejected the gospel of Barnabas and said, yep, it's false. But it, it took a little while to work that out. So uh, that's part of the Dawah experience for a Christian who's not ready. Yeah, one of my first experiences with this was a Muslim presenting all the, the affirmations of Christ. Um, trying to convince me that the Jesus that's in the Quran is the Jesus that everyone should believe in all these things. And what I found, what I really realized is a lot of Christians were not prepared to really deal with a lot of the objections and even the commonalities. Even if some Christians are, you know, they're, they're somewhat sufficient with the objections, but then they don't know how to deal with some of the commonalities that a Muslim would posit from the Quran. 
So I think it's extraordinarily important for those kind of main and plain things of essential doctrines for Christians to be familiar with and to be familiar with some of the arguments that Islam will give you on the commonalities that they see of Christ. And it all comes down to the person, finished work, and nature of Christ. So utterly important that we can't remove that at all from the gospel. I don't hold to a concept called friendship evangelism because what saves people, what the normal means that God uses is the proclamation of the gospel. If you want your feet beautiful, Romans 10, 15, it's an accurate presentation, simple presentation of the gospel. Never underestimate the power of the gospel. It has the same power today as it did over 2,000 years ago, and this is the normal means God uses, but sometimes Christians get sidetracked because they're not prepared for a lot of the arguments or assertions. They're not arguments, assertions that Islam will give, Muslims will give, especially when it, it comes to uh, which we'll deal with tomorrow comes to attacking the New Testament reliability. And, you know, most Christians don't, you know, they're not privy of all these textual issues, so they, they don't know what to say. But never underestimate, even if you don't have the arguments, because there's always going to be someone smarter, never underestimate the power of the proclamation of the finished work of Christ and the gospel. The gospel is the gospel of the Son. And we have to understand that going in. We have to be equipped with that before we can argue even the reliability of Scripture. Because even if you can convince them that our Scriptures are intact, it doesn't assure salvation for any Muslim. That's the job of God. So, anyways, that was my experience where a Muslim was actually trying to assert the commonalities that he thought Christianity had with him. You want to go next? <laughs> Let me, I just want to share a verse from the Quran that uh, includes the idea of dawah. There's one usually her here uh, that Shadid referred to. That's the common one given. I believe it's 16125. But I want to share another one. This is from the Khan translation because it fits in my bag. I want to read the full context of this because the context shows you, frankly, how strange the Quran is. I'm not saying being strange makes it false, but I want to show you from their perspective. So here we are in 2, Surah 2, 221 to get the context. And then you're going to see the concept of dawah embedded in these verses. So listen to this. Do not marry women who associate partners with God until they believe. A believing bondwoman is better than a woman who associates partners with God however pleasing she may appear to you. So even if the Christian woman looks good, it's better to have an ugly Muslim. That's what this is saying. Nor give believing women in marriage to men who associate partners with God till they have believed. A believing bondman is certainly better than a man who associates partners with God, even though he may please you. Such people, so this is those who associate partners with God, that's a slur for Christians, because we believe in the deity of Jesus. Such people call you to hellfire or invite you to hellfire. So the Quran has Christians inviting as well. Where are we inviting them, according to the Quran? We're inviting them to hellfire, according to the Quran. So that's, that's the way our evangelism will be seen. And the next verse says, but God calls you to paradise and to forgiveness. So do you see in the context of these relations, you have this idea of being called or invited. And the Christians are calling you to hellfire, but God calls you to this. And the very next verse says this. So we're reading about Dawa. Such people call you to hellfire, but God calls you to paradise and forgiveness. He makes his message clear to people so that they might bear them in mind. They ask you about menstruation. Say it is an impurity. So keep away from women during it and do not approach them until they are cleansed. When they are cleansed, you may approach them as God ordained. God loves those who turn to him in penitence, and he loves those who keep themselves clean. Your wives are your fields. Go then into your fields as you will. So that's the full context there. Um, I, I'm like Anthony in that my uh, first encounters with Dawa were in prison. Um, and uh, so you're talking 
probably 96, 97 that I started interacting with Muslims in prison. So it's like, you know, going on 25 years and they would actually have a, a Dawa table set up uh, there in the prison as you're walking through and they'd hand you tracks and so on. But I would actually go and read them and start looking into them. And uh, this is where I first started encountering these arguments. And I remember I still have the, I still have those tracks that they were handing out. I saved them. Um, but matter of fact, I should make a video about those one day so I can actually go through some of these tracks from way back in the day. But uh, one of the ones where I really started looking into it was on was claiming that Muhammad's in the Bible, and it was about Song of Solomon 516. Uh, some of you may be familiar with that. And, uh, uh, you know, actually, I, I, didn't, I didn't know how to respond to this. I had no clue, right? I'm reading a tract, and it says Muhammad's mentioned by name in Song of Solomon 516, the actual word here is the plural of respect for, for the name Muhammad. And translators have mistranslated it to hide the fact that Muhammad is mentioned by name. I had no, I had no idea how to respond to that. So I start looking into it and then start, you know, so all I had was I had a Strong's Concordance and I look up, wait a minute, this word happens a bunch of times in the Old Testament. And in none of these cases, does it make any sense to translate it as Muhammad and so on. So I actually started um, having discussions with the Muslims there, and they stopped handing out that tract. So that was actually that was actually cool. Um, but they would hand out, then they'd, they'd be handing out other ones and so on. And I noticed the same problem over and over again. And I've seen this nonstop for 25 years or so now. Dawah, the real purpose of Dawah is to exploit people's ignorance in order to convert them to Islam. And it, when I say ignorance here, I don't mean people who don't know anything. You can, you can find something. Even You could have a very, very knowledgeable person and find things that he doesn't know about because you're just bringing them up for the same time. So uh, Samuel talked about the Gospel of Barnabas. Think about this. 20 years ago, if you go up to Christians and start talking about the Gospel of Barnabas, they know what you're talking about? No. No one has any clue what you're talking about. So you can, you can aha, this is about Muhammad, and th this was the original, this was the original gospel, and so on. But they don't know how to respond to that. It's brand new to them. Right? Until Christians actually start looking into the response, and they find out it's written a thousand years later, and so on, and then it, it, it's, a, it's a terrible, terrible argument. Um, what happens then? Well, you, you, you change the argument, right? Or you either change the argument with people who have figured out that that is a bad argument, or you find people who aren't familiar with that argument yet, right? And keep using it against them. And so like right now, I could walk up to you and say, ah, did you know that in the gospel of Ahimelech, it refers to Muhammad by name? Who can refute me? Who's ready to quote the gospel of Ahimelech to tell me that I'm wrong? No one, ha ha, you see, slam dunk argument. You all, you're all ignorant. This is why you don't know anything about Islam. You, you don't know that you haven't studied, right? You could, you could do this to anyone. And that's, what's been, that's what I've seen for 25 years now. It's let's use some argument, horrible, horrible argument. Once people start catching on to how bad the argument is, change the argument for them, come up with a new one. Come up with a new one that's just as bad, but it's new and they're not familiar with it. And you can still use the old argument with people who haven't encountered this before, um, but that's, that's, how, that's how it's working out, right? And this was amazingly successful for a long time mainly before the rise of the internet, where it became much easier to look up responses and to find these arguments and to expose them. Um, and matter of fact, one of the first articles I ever wrote online, way before I was making videos, like 2003 or something like this, uh, I, I, made an, I wrote an article called The Information Superhighway and the Death of Mah Mohammedanism. And I argued that because of the internet, all these lies that they've been telling all this time, it's going to catch up with them. It's going to catch up with them. Um, because yeah, you can keep changing your argument, but there comes a point when you made this argument and we exposed it and then you changed your argument and made this one and we exposed it and you changed the argument again and we exposed it. And so first it was not a single letters difference anywhere in the entire history of the Quran. Um, then we exposed that. Then it was, ah, but you know, it's just different dialects. Then we exposed that. Then it was, oh yes, but they, you know, yes, it's revealed differently in different words. And sometimes they even contradict each other, but they complement each other. And so they're constantly changing the argument. But there comes a point when people realize, wow, I, I really can't trust anything you're saying. Because every, every time one of you Dawah guys gives me an argument, as the moment we try to look into it, we find out it's totally bogus and then you change your argument. And people are starting to catch on about that. And what do you get? What do you get now? An avalanche.
So remember, Dawa is the Islamic, quote unquote, version of evangelism. Always remember, though, that the average Muslim out there is much more is much more prepared to hear the gospel than the average Christian is prepared to share it. So as long as we are always focused on that and getting that out there, God's going to use that for his glory.